This is Reed Daly's Come Follow Me podcast. In this podcast series, lesson and scripture audio are combined for a hands-free experience. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. At the end of this podcast, you can hear our full disclosure statement or read it on readdaily.live. June 14th through the 20th. Doctrine and Covenants, section 64 through 66. The Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind. President Henry B. Eyring said, quote, I often go to the scriptures with the questions, what would God have me do? Or what would he have me feel? Invariably, I find new ideas and thoughts I have never had before. End quote. From How God Speaks to Me Through the Scriptures, February 6, 2019 blog.churchofjesuschrist.org. In the sweltering heat of August 1831, several elders were traveling back to Kirtland after surveying the land of Zion in Missouri as directed by the Lord. It was not a pleasant journey. The travelers, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Sidney Rigdon, Ezra Booth, and others, were hot and weary, and tensions soon turned into quarrels. It may have seemed like building Zion, a city of love, unity, and peace, was going to take a long time. Fortunately, building Zion, in Missouri in 1831, or in our hearts and wards today, doesn't require us to be perfect. Instead, of you it is required to forgive, the Lord said. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verse 10. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. He requires the heart and a willing mind. See verse 34. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. And he requires patience and diligence, for Zion is built on the foundation of small things accomplished by those who do not become weary in well-doing. See verse 33. Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. See also Saints, Volume 1, pages 133 through 134. Soon after the funeral, Ezra and other church elders started their journey back to Kirtland with Joseph, Oliver, and Sidney. Ezra was relieved to be returning home to Ohio. Unlike Edward, he had not had a change of heart about Joseph or the location of Zion. The men launched canoes onto the wide Missouri River just north of Independence and paddled downstream. At the end of the first day of travel, they were in good spirits and enjoyed a dinner of wild turkey along the riverbank. On the following day, however, the August weather was hot and the river was wild and difficult to navigate. The men quickly grew tired and soon began criticizing each other. As the Lord God liveth, Oliver finally shouted at the men, if you do not behave better, some accident will befall you. Joseph took the lead in his canoe the next afternoon, but some of the elders were upset with him and Oliver and refused to paddle. At a dangerous bend in the river, they hit a submerged tree and nearly capsized. Fearing for the lives of everyone in the company, Joseph and Sidney ordered the elders off the river. After they set up camp, Joseph, Oliver, and Sidney tried to talk to the group and ease tensions. Irritated, the men called Joseph and Sidney cowards for getting off the river, mocked the way Oliver paddled his canoe, and accused Joseph of acting like a dictator. The quarrel lasted long into the night. Rather than stay up with the company, Ezra went to bed early, deeply critical of Joseph and the elders. Why, he wondered, would the Lord trust the keys of his kingdom to men like these? And 136 through 137. When Joseph returned to Kirtland in late August 1831, tension still lingered between him and a few of the elders who had gone with him to Independence. 
After their quarrel on the banks of the Missouri River, Joseph and most of the elders traveling with him had humbled themselves, confessed their sins, and sought forgiveness. The next morning, the Lord had forgiven them and offered reassurance and encouragement. Inasmuch as you have humbled yourselves before me, he had said, the blessings of the kingdom are yours. Other elders, Ezra Booth among them, did not heed the revelation or resolve their differences with Joseph. When Ezra returned to Kirtland, he continued to criticize Joseph and complain about his actions on the mission. A conference of saints soon revoked Ezra's preaching license, and he began writing his friends scathing letters attacking Joseph's character. The Lord rebuked these attacks in early September and called on the elders to stop condemning Joseph's errors and criticizing him without cause. He has sinned, the Lord acknowledged, but verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, forgive sins unto those who confess their sins before me and ask forgiveness. He admonished the saints to be forgiving as well. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, he declared. But of you it is required to forgive all men. He also urged the saints to do good and build up Zion, rather than let their disagreements divide them. Be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, he reminded them. The Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. Before concluding his words, the Lord called a few church members to sell their property and go to Missouri. Most of the saints were to stay in Ohio, however, and continue sharing the gospel there. For I, the Lord, will, he told Joseph, to retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years. Ideas for Personal Scripture Study Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 1 through 11. I am required to forgive everyone. As you read Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 1 through 11, think about a time when the Lord forgave you. You might also think about someone you need to forgive. How does the Savior's compassion affect your feelings about yourself and about others? Behold, thus saith the Lord your God unto you, O ye elders of my church. Hearken ye and hear, and receive my will concerning you. For verily I say unto you, I will that ye should overcome the world. Wherefore, I will have compassion upon you. There are those among you who have sinned, but verily I say, for this once, for mine own glory, and for the salvation of souls, I have forgiven you your sins. I will be merciful unto you, for I have given unto you the kingdom, and the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom shall not be taken from my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., through the means I have appointed, while he liveth, inasmuch as he obeyeth mine ordinances. There are those who have sought occasion against him without cause. Nevertheless, he has sinned. But verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, forgive sins unto those who confess their sins before me, and ask forgiveness, who have not sinned unto death. My disciples in days of old sought occasion against one another, and forgave not one another in their hearts. And for this evil they were afflicted, and sorely chastened. Wherefore I say unto you, that ye ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses, standeth condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I the Lord will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you it is required to forgive all men. And ye ought to say in your hearts, Let God judge between me and thee, and reward thee according to thy deeds. Why do you think the Lord commands us to forgive all? See verse 10. If you struggle to forgive, consider what the following resources teach about how the Savior can help. Jeffrey R. Holland, The Ministry of Reconciliation, Ensigner Liahona, November 2018. Guide to the Scriptures, Forgive, scriptures.churchofjesuschrist.org. Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 31 through 34. God requires my heart and a willing mind. Have you ever felt weary with all the well-doing you are trying to accomplish? Look for the Lord's message to you in Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 31 through 34.
And behold, I the Lord declare unto you, and my words are sure, and shall not fail, that they shall obtain it. But all things must come to pass in their time. Wherefore be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. What does it mean to give your heart and a willing mind to God? See verse 34. Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 41 through 43. Zion shall be an ensign unto the people. An ensign is a flag or standard around which people gather in a unity of purpose or identity. See Guide to the Scriptures, ensign, scriptures.churchofjesuschrist.org. How has Zion, or the Lord's Church, been like an ensign to you? Consider these other examples of things that are held up like an ensign to bless the people. See Numbers, chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Alma chapter 46, verses 11 through 20. And now it came to pass that when Moroni, who was the chief commander of the armies of the Nephites, had heard of these dissensions, he was angry with Amalickiah. And it came to pass that he rent his coat, and he took a piece thereof, and wrote upon it, In memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children. And he fastened it upon the end of a pole. And he fastened on his head plate, and his breastplate, and his shields, and girded on his armor about his loins. And he took the pole, which had on the end thereof his rent coat, and he called it the title of liberty. And he bowed himself to the earth, and he prayed mightily unto his God for the blessings of liberty to rest upon his brethren, so long as there should a band of Christians remain to possess the land. For thus were all the true believers of Christ, who belonged to the church of God, called by those who did not belong to the church. And those who did belong to the church were faithful. Yea, all those who were true believers in Christ took upon them gladly the name of Christ, or Christians, as they were called, because of their belief in Christ who should come. And therefore, at this time, Moroni prayed that the cause of the Christians and the freedom of the land might be favored. And it came to pass that when he had poured out his soul to God, he named all the land which was south of the land desolation, yea, and in fine, all the land, both on the north and on the south, a chosen land, and the land of liberty. And he said, Surely God shall not suffer that we, who are despised because we take upon us the name of Christ, shall be trodden down and destroyed until we bring it upon us by our own transgressions. And when Moroni had said these words, he went forth among the people, waving the rent part of his garment in the air, that all might see the writing which he had written upon the rent part, and crying with a loud voice, saying, Behold, whosoever will maintain this title upon the land, let them come forth in the strength of the Lord, and enter into a covenant that they will maintain their rights 
and their religion, that the Lord God may bless them. What do these verses teach you about how you can help the church be an ensign where you live? Look for other ways the Lord describes Zion in Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 41 through 43. For behold, I say unto you, that Zion shall flourish, and the glory of the Lord shall be upon her, and she shall be an ensign unto the people, and there shall come unto her out of every nation under heaven. And the day shall come when the nations of the earth shall tremble because of her, and shall fear because of her terrible ones. The Lord hath spoken it. Amen. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 65 Prepare ye the way of the Lord Matthew described John the Baptist as one who cried, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. See Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. See also Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 65, the Lord uses similar language to describe His latter-day work. Section 65, Revelation on Prayer given through Joseph Smith the Prophet at Hiram, Ohio, October 30, 1831. 1 through 2, The keys of the kingdom of God are committed to man on earth, and the gospel cause will triumph. 3 through 6, the millennial kingdom of heaven will come and join the kingdom of God on earth. Hearken and lo, a voice as of one sent down from on high, who is mighty and powerful, whose going forth is unto the ends of the earth, yea, whose voice is unto men. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hands shall roll forth, until it has filled the whole earth. Yea, a voice crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, prepare ye the supper of the Lamb, make ready for the bridegroom. Pray unto the Lord, call upon his holy name, make known his wonderful works among the people. Call upon the Lord, that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it, and be prepared for the days to come, in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God, which is set up on the earth. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God go forth, that the kingdom of heaven may come, that thou, O God, mayest be glorified in heaven, so on earth, that thine enemies may be subdued, for thine is the honor, power, and glory for ever and ever. Amen. What similarities do you see between what John the Baptist did, see Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 12, and what the Lord wants us to do today? In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. 
Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What do you find in this revelation that inspires you to help fulfill the prophecies it contains? Ponder ways you can make known God's wonderful works among the people. See verse 4. Doctrine and Covenants, section 66. The Lord knows the thoughts of my heart. Shortly after joining the church, William E. McClellan asked Joseph Smith to reveal God's will for him. Joseph didn't know it, but William had five personal questions he was hoping the Lord would answer through his prophet. We don't know what William's questions were, but we do know that the revelation addressed to him, now Doctrine and Covenants, section 66, answered each question to William's full and entire satisfaction. See William McClellan's Five Questions, from Revelations in Context, page 138. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 66 After the conference, McClellan traveled to Kirtland and, in the course of his journey, stepped off of a large log and strained my ankle very badly, so much so that he petitioned Joseph to heal him. He laid his hands on the ankle, McClellan wrote in his journal, and it was healed, although it was swelled much and had pained me severely. Just a few days later, McClellan decided to test Joseph Smith's calling. After going to Joseph's home in Hiram, Ohio, on October 29th, McClellan went before the Lord in secret and on my knees asked him to reveal the answer to five questions through his prophet. Without letting Joseph know what these five questions were, McClellan asked Joseph to provide to him God's will. The resulting revelation, now known as Doctrine and Covenants, section 66, answered McClellan's five questions to his full and entire satisfaction. Even after he later fell away from the church, McClellan stated that he still considered this revelation an evidence of Joseph's prophetic calling, which, he said, I cannot refute. As you read section 66, think about what the Lord knew about William McClellan and the concerns and intents of his heart. Section 66. Revelation given through Joseph Smith the Prophet at Hiram, Ohio, October 29, 1831. William E. McClellan had petitioned the Lord in secret to make known through the Prophet the answer to five questions which were unknown to Joseph Smith. At McClellan's request, the Prophet inquired of the Lord and received this revelation. 1 through 4. The everlasting covenant is the fullness of the gospel. 5 through 8. Elders are to preach, testify, and reason with the people. 9 through 13. Faithful ministerial service ensures an inheritance of eternal life. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto my servant, William E. McClellan. Blessed are you, inasmuch as you have turned away from your iniquities, and have received my truths saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Savior of the world, even of as many as believe on my name. Verily I say unto you, Blessed are you for receiving mine everlasting covenant, even the fullness of my gospel, sent forth unto the children of men, that they might have life, and be made partakers of the glories which are to be revealed in the last days, as it was written by the prophets and apostles in days of old. Verily I say unto you, my servant William, that you are clean, but not all. Repent therefore of those things which are not pleasing in my sight, saith the Lord, for the Lord will show them unto you. And now verily I, the Lord, will show unto you what I will concerning you, or what is my will concerning you. Behold, verily I say unto you, that it is my will that you should proclaim my gospel from land to land, and from city to city. Yea, in those regions round about, where it has not been proclaimed. Tarry not many days in this place. 
Go not up unto the land of Zion as yet, but inasmuch as you can send, send. Otherwise, think not of thy property. Go unto the eastern lands, bear testimony in every place, unto every people, and in their synagogues, reasoning with the people. Let my servant Samuel H. Smith go with you, and forsake him not, and give him thine instructions. And he that is faithful shall be made strong in every place, and I the Lord will go with you. Lay your hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Return not till I the Lord shall send you. Be patient in affliction. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Seek not to be cumbered. Forsake all unrighteousness. Commit not adultery, a temptation with which thou hast been troubled. Keep these sayings, for they are true and faithful. And thou shalt magnify thine office, and push many people to Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads. Continue in these things even unto the end, and you shall have a crown of eternal life at the right hand of my Father, who is full of grace and truth. Verily, thus saith the Lord your God, your Redeemer, even Jesus Christ. Amen. How has the Lord revealed that He knows you? If you have a patriarchal blessing, consider studying it. As you do, what does the Holy Ghost help you understand about God's will for you? See also Saints, Volume 1, pages 138 through 140. Hundreds of miles southwest of Kirtland, 25-year-old William McClellan visited the graves of his wife, Cynthia Ann, and their baby. William and Cynthia Ann had been married for less than two years when she and the baby died. As a schoolteacher, William had a quick mind and a gift for writing, but he found nothing to comfort him in the lonely hours since he lost his family. One day, after teaching his class, William heard two men preach about the Book of Mormon. One of them, David Whitmer, declared that he had seen an angel who testified that the Book of Mormon was true. The other, Harvey Whitlock, astonished William with the power and clarity of his preaching. William invited the men to teach him more, and he was again struck by Harvey's words. I never heard such preaching in all my life, William wrote in his journal. The glory of God seemed to encircle the man. Eager to meet Joseph Smith and investigate his claims, William followed David and Harvey to Independence. Joseph had already returned to Kirtland by the time they arrived, but William met Edward Partridge, Martin Harris, and Hiram Smith and heard their testimonies. He also spoke with other men and women in Zion and marveled at the love and peace he saw among them. While taking a long walk through the woods one day, he talked with Hiram about the Book of Mormon and the beginning of the church. William wanted to believe, but in spite of everything he had heard so far, he still was not convinced to join the church. He wanted a witness from God that he had found the truth. Early the next morning, he prayed for direction. Reflecting on his study of the Book of Mormon, William realized it had opened his mind to new light. He knew then that it was true and felt honor-bound to testify of it. He was certain he had found the living church of Jesus Christ. Hiram baptized and confirmed William later that day, and the two men soon set out for Kirtland. As they preached along the way, William discovered he had a talent for captivating audiences and debating ministers. He sometimes acted arrogantly when he preached, however, and he felt bad when his boasting drove the spirit away. Once they arrived in Kirtland, William was anxious to speak with Joseph. He had several specific questions he wanted answered, but he kept them to himself, praying that Joseph would discern them on his own and reveal their answers. William was now unsure where to go and what to do with his life. Without a family, he could devote himself fully to the Lord's work, but part of him wanted to look out for his own welfare first. That night, William went home with Joseph and asked him for a revelation from the Lord, as he knew many others had done. Joseph agreed, and as the prophet received the revelation, William heard the Lord answer each of his questions. His anxiety gave way to joy. He knew he had found a prophet of God. 
Gospel Topics, Patriarchal Blessings, topics.churchofjesuschrist.org. Ideas for Family Scripture Study and Home Evening. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 64, Verses 8-10. through 10. Family relationships provide many opportunities to learn to forgive. Maybe family members could talk about how forgiving each other has blessed your family. How has the Savior helped us forgive each other? How are we afflicted, see verse 8, when we don't forgive others? Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verse 33. What does Heavenly Father want your family to do to bring about His great work? Maybe it's going to the temple, sharing the gospel with a neighbor, or overcoming contention. Perhaps each family member could collect small objects like rocks or buttons or puzzle pieces and use them to represent small things we can do every day to lay the foundation for God's great work. As a family, pick one of these small things to work on this week. Doctrine and Covenants, section 66, verse 3. How will you teach the importance of repenting? You could serve some food on a plate that is partially clean and read the Lord's words to William McClellan. You are clean, but not all. Then you could clean the plate and share the food while discussing how Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to be spiritually clean. Doctrine and Covenants, section 66, verse 10. How can your family follow the Lord's counsel to seek not to be cumbered or burdened with many things to do? You could talk about the story of Mary and Martha. See Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 and discuss how your family can keep from being cumbered by things that aren't of eternal value. For other ideas for teaching children, see this week's outline and come follow me for primary. Suggested song, Help Me, Dear Father, Children's Songbook 99. Improving our teaching. Be available and accessible. Some of the best teaching moments start as questions or concerns in the hearts of family members. Let family members know through your words and actions that you are eager to hear them. See Teaching in the Savior's Way, page 16. Thank you for listening to Read Daily's Come Follow Me podcast. Please share this podcast with family members and friends who can find us on readdaily.live or their favorite podcast application. The Intellectual Property Department of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kindly granting permission to use the audio content heard in this podcast. We express our gratitude for their generosity. Along with granting permission, they ask that we make the following statement. Any products offered by ReadDaily.Live are neither made, provided, approved, nor endorsed by Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any content or opinions expressed, implied, or included with any goods or services offered by ReadDaily.Live are solely those of Howard Patrick Holman and not those of Intellectual Reserve, Inc. or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.